and we're ready, huh? All yours, Kurt. Welcome to the Toledo Zoo and Aquarium virtual event on animal behavior, sponsored by the University of Toledo Retirees Association. I'm Kurt Black, this year's president of UTRA, and I'm very pleased that you could join us for this afternoon's program. Today's program is the second in 2021 that we are offering electronically. And I am delighted that we have exciting program opportunities to share with you in March and in April. So please stay connected at the end of today's presentation to learn more about what we have on tap. For today, I am most pleased to have with us Alexandra Burris. Alexandra is the coordinator of school and community programs with the Toledo Zoo. She's graduated uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree in zoology from Miami University and a PhD in science education from Indiana University. She's been with the zoo for about three and a half years. So with no further delay, I am pleased to welcome to this UTRA and the University of Toledo Alumni Association event, Alexandra Burris. Alexandra. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Alex and we're actually gonna be tossing it around the zoo today because we've got a really special program for you where we're gonna see animals out on grounds and we also have a really special um, uh, appearance by our curator of animal behavior as well. So we're gonna be popping it back and forth a little bit. I'll be your tour guide out in the zoo today, um, but we're gonna actually start by tossing it over to my colleague, Nicole, who is with our curator of animal behavior today so that she can get us started talking to us a little bit about uh, what behavior is and how we work with animal behavior at the zoo. And then uh, I'll be back on board with you guys to show you a little bit around uh, the animals here. So uh, with that, I'll toss it over to Nicole. All right, hello everybody. My name is Nicole um, and I am also here in the zoo. So we are going to have a special treat right away. We're gonna talk about uh, with our curator of animal behavior. So uh, basically animal behavior is anything uh, an animal does. Um, and we look at kind of how they behave with how they survive. So they do certain things to get food and water. Um, and then at the zoo, we have to provide them with special experiences. So uh, I'm gonna take us over to our tamarin exhibit. And if you don't know what tamarins are, they are small monkeys. So sometimes they are a little shy in front of the camera, but I'm gonna turn it around here and we will talk to Beth and look at our tamarins. Hi everybody, my name is Beth Posta and I'm the curator of behavior here at the zoo. First of all, can you all hear me okay? Can you get thumbs up? Any? Okay, okay. So I've been at the zoo for a little over 20 years now. And basically my job is to oversee the animal training and enrichment program and our animal wellness program. So I thought I would give you a little bit of an introduction as to what the behavior program entails. And that's basically comprised of animal training and enrichment. With our training program, we work very cooperatively with the animals in order to have them participate in their own care. So that might entail training them to go on and off exhibit on a cue, which is really helpful for getting them off at night. But especially if there's a weather event, that we, a, a severe weather event, you may see keepers all over the zoo ringing cowbells and blowing whistles and using other cues that the animals know uh, is their signal to come inside for dinner or a special treat or something like that, and then we can get them to move very, very quickly when we need to. Um, we also work with them so that they voluntarily participate in their own medical and health care. So just like we all go to the doctor for a physical exam, so do the animals, except we bring the doctor or the veterinarian to the animals. And many of them are trained to present body parts so we can do our examination without any kind of anesthesia or, or restraint. So many of the animals, for example, are trained to come right up to the mesh. Oh, we've got glass here, but you can see some mesh up there. And uh, for the animals that we don't uh, go in with, which is many of them, they're trained to come up to the mesh and present a body part. We might train them for uh, an injection either in their shoulder or their hip so they can get a vaccine or if they need an injection for, an, um, for another procedure. Uh, we train them to open their mouths so we can look at their teeth, their tongues, their gums, and do a dental exam. They're trained to present their abdomen and their chest right up to the mesh so we can get ultrasounds both on abdomens for pregnancy detection and monitoring, but also uh, for their heart so we can monitor cardiac health. Um, they're trained to present their hands and their feet 
Um, we have our gorillas trained to put their fingers through the mesh so that we can file their nails when they get too long. And the cheetahs can get nail trims by putting their claws through the mesh. So things like that throughout the zoo. And it's all based on voluntary cooperation with the animals or positive reinforcement. So the animals are rewarded for doing the behavior and they can leave at any time. So it's up to us to build a really strong, trusting relationship with them so that they want to come up and work with us on these behaviors. And when we're training them, we focus on starting with something the animal knows that might just be sitting in front of us and eating. And then we build on that one very small step at a time until we get to the final goal. So for the, the injection behavior, what we might do is have the animal put their shoulder up against the mesh and then we'll very slowly put a dowel rod or something really dull very slowly through the mesh until we can touch them and reward them for that. Once they're comfortable with that, then we might touch them through the mesh with a like a paper clip or something like that. <laughs> um, or something like that and get them desensitized to feeling something a little bit sharper on their arm. Until then we might cut the tip of the needle off and touch them with, with something a little bit sharper until finally they're used to being poked with something a little bit sharper, we can give them the injection. All the while, they can leave if they want to. The enrichment program is um, really based on encouraging behaviors that are natural for the animals in the wild. So we do a lot of research on the natural history of the species. So basically, where they live, what kind of habitat, um, do they live in the trees, in the water, on the ground, or a combination of both? What is their social structure like, their mating system? What do signs of stress look like? Um, when do they disperse from their original their natal group and things like that. And we take all of that information and what we know about the species and then we set goals for their behavior of what we wanna do with enrichment, what we wanna encourage. And then we can design activities and, uh, and options for them to do those things. So can you show us some enrichment in this exhibit absolutely. right behind you? Sure. So you can see some things hanging up here uh, from the tamarind exhibit. So that green ball there has some holes in it. We can put food in there. So because most animals in the wild spend at least half of their time searching for food, food enrichment is a big part of our program. So we may make it just a little bit challenging for them, but in a way that is very natural and how they might get food in the wild. So for the tamarinds, they might be picking food off trees or leaves and things like that. So we would give them puzzles that encourage that picking. So they may pull things out of that ball. Uh, we also have bas the basket up there with some substrate in it. And that's an area where they can make a nest and rest um, because nesting is really important for a lot of animals. But also the opportunity to retreat from each other or maybe the visitors would be important as well. Um, different hammocks, different platforms that allow them to have different um, visual opportunities so they can go high or low and see what's going on outside of their environment and react to that. So the enrichment is really about providing them with a lot of choices of how to spend their day, with whom to interact, um, where to go, what to do. And we try to provide them with opportunities throughout the day. So you may see the keepers coming into the exhibit two or three times a day, uh, providing different enrichment opportunities so that the animals have choices throughout the 24 hour period. All right, I'm gonna see if we can get a little bit closer view of our tamarind. So I'm gonna go right around the corner because I know you could see them in the back here. And there's another good picture of enrichment with a basket. So here we have a male and a female tamarind. So there's one on this side and one on this side right here. They can get to each other. They're just hanging out on each side. And then here's a good picture of a basket. Does anyone have any questions uh, for Beth? You can write them in the chat. Otherwise, I will throw it back to Alex, who's in our museum because she's at some other animals we're gonna take a look at. All right, hi everybody. Yeah, from this point forward, especially uh, feel free to type into the chat. Um, it looks like we might have a question for Beth real quick, Nicole, if you're able to take that. 
Um, they asked, what's her best advice for becoming a primate keeper? Oh, great question. Um, this is a, a really exciting uh, field to get into. What we recommend for anybody that wants to work in a zoo and be a, a zookeeper is a degree, a bachelor's degree in zoology or biology or some kind of related field, even psychology is good. Um, but then also experience working with animals, whether it's paid experience or volunteer experience, volunteer at the zoo at a horse stable, the local humane society, and get that experience of what it takes to care for animals. Um, internships in college are really helpful if you can get an internship at a zoo. All of that experience combined is going to help a, a zoo know, uh, first of all, help the this person know that this is the field that they want to be in because it's, it's not as glamorous as it may look. <laughs> um, there's a lot of cleaning that goes in with all of the other great things that we do. Um, but also it helps the, the, the zoo know that their applicant really has the experience and knows what it takes to care for animals. So anything like that would really help them get a job as a primate keeper. Let's see, Denise, um, you said uh, something about the alarm going off. Uh, I will tell you, we are doing currently an animal escape drill. No animals have escaped. We're just doing a drill so we all know what to do. And so you may have heard that going off there for a second. Um, let's see, somebody asked how old the tamarins were. I am not positive how old they are, do you know? I do not know that either. Yeah. We can find that out and get back to them. Yeah, we, we will try to figure that out. Um, have you seen a change in animal behavior with the lessening of visitors? Ah, another good question. For some animals we have, um, part of our, our wellness program is really looking at the impact of visitors on the animals because some animals really thrive with the visitors. So you may notice when you come to the zoo that you're looking at the animals, but they spend just as much time watching us. And so when the visitors go away, they don't really understand why. So while we were closed, we did make sure that we had people walking by the exhibits and visiting with the animals that really thrive on that um, so that it wasn't completely barren. Um, and then it gave us an opportunity also to see if other animal behaviors changed because there weren't visitors there to see if maybe they um, utilize the exhibit a little bit differently. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of that, um, but really it was the animals that, that tend to interact with the visitors more. We, we had to make sure that we tended to those needs for them. That's a great question. That is. All right. Well, thank you, Beth. I will let Alex take back over. Thank you. All right. So uh, we are actually in our natural history museum right now. So uh, I'll be traveling around to a couple of different exhibits to see some unique animal behavior. So, so far, uh, we have taken a look at a mammal and the tamarins. We're going to look at a different taxa of animals right now. Here we have a Komodo dragon, and she's kind of right up against the glass for us. Uh, so the Komodo dragon uh, is a really good example of some animal behaviors. So basically, today we're going to be talking a little bit about how animals have behaviors in the wild that help them to survive and that are adaptive, which means it helps them to get their needs met, and how we might simulate some of those behaviors in the zoo to make sure that our animals are getting the best possible uh, life that they can here in captivity. Uh, so the Komodo dragon, uh, you may know, is one of is the largest lizard in the world. Um, so they live in kind of Indonesia area, and they are a predator. Uh, so that means that they are at the top of the food chain, and they're going to use everything that they can to uh, get their prey. And so they have some really cool behaviors that they will use uh, in the wild. Uh, not the least of which is their venom. So this is a venomous animal. Um, for a long time, scientists actually uh, thought that the Komodo dragon did not have venom. Um, we have two Komodo dragons, so I'll kind of pop over so you can see the other one too. Uh, for a long time, scientists thought that Komodo dragons did not have venom. They actually thought that Komodo dragons uh, killed their prey using a bacteria in their mouth. And the reason for that is because the Komodo dragon, uh, their behavior is to bite uh, one of their prey animals and oftentimes uh, not kill it right away. And then what they'll do is they will follow uh, around that animal until it eventually dies and then they can eat it as a snack. Um, so kind of a, a gross way of hunting, um, but basically what we found out more recently is that they have venom that is a little slower acting. Um, so it kills the animal over time. 
and then they have a really good sense of smell that allows them to track their prey over time. Uh, now you might know that reptiles, they don't smell exactly the same way that we smell. They use their tongue. So they will stick their tongue out uh, and that allows them to detect chemicals in the air that they can then follow. Uh, and they can actually run pretty quickly when they need to, so they can get uh, almost uh, three to six miles an hour, which is pretty good for a uh, Komodo dragon. Uh, and Darnell asked, what are they fed? Which is uh, going right into uh, kind of what I was going to talk about next, which is how do we care for an animal that has such unique behaviors here in a zoo setting? Um, so here at the zoo, we actually will feed them mice. Um, they get mice and actually hard boiled eggs uh, and rats. So they get frozen food basically. Um, but what, what we do is we simulate some of that foraging behavior by placing their food in different areas of their exhibit. So you can see they actually have some climbing structures in here in a little pool. And we will place the, the mice and other food items, oops, there the other one's getting up to move around, so that they can uh, forage for that food. Now, what's really cool about the Komodo dragons, and one of the reasons I wanted to show them uh, for an animal behavior talk is because we are actually training our Komodo dragons to respond to a laser pointer, which sounds pretty crazy, like a, a cat or a dog might respond to a laser pointer. Uh, this big reptile, uh, their keepers will actually uh, train a behavior by pointing to their food item with the laser and then they know that they can respond to that laser so that can get the that can have a lot of benefits for us at the zoo. Uh, not only could it get them some exercise, but it's going to allow us to uh, move them to different areas of their enclosures so that we can better take care of them. Um, and better provide them with medical care by having uh, a way to look them over when the veterinarian staff come over. Um, and we do not go in there with them. Uh, so Luann asked, how do we place the food in the area? Uh, just like Beth said, we don't generally go in with the animals. So they have a shifting mechanism, uh, basically a door that opens, and then they can use that laser pointer to get the Komodo dragon to go in through the door. And then they can go out into the exhibit, place the food while the Komodo dragon's uh, behind the scenes, and then they're going to let the Komodo dragon come back out. Uh, so it's pretty cool how we can use animal behavior not only to benefit uh, the animal's mental state, but also uh, help us uh, with taking better care of them. Um, we do have a full-time veterinarian. Um, we actually have a couple of full-time veterinarians that will come uh, and take care of animals. So they do rounds and they also respond to uh, any emergencies that might happen. Um, so I wanted to show you while I'm still here in our museum, uh, one more animal that has a really cool behavior in the wild. Um, and then we'll go see if we can find some more animals. So this one is one that you may not have heard of. Some of you may have heard of the Komodo dragon. This one's one of my favorites. This is called a ribbed newt. And we're going to get nice and close to this one here. So the ribbed newt is uh, from areas over in Asia. And you probably can recognize that it is underwater based on the bubbling there. This is an amphibian. Uh, so amphibians have a lot of unique behaviors in the wild as well, but this one has a super unique behavior. Uh, the reason it's called a rib newt is when it is threatened by a predator, it will actually poke its ribs out through the sides of its body. Um, so there are certain behaviors that uh, we might consider more uh, kind of choices that animals might make uh, to go after their food. This is more of a automated response. So when it's grabbed by something, those ribs are going to pop out through its skin and they actually have venom on the sides of their ribs that help them to scare uh, that predator away. Um, so that's a pretty cool behavior. And don't worry, their skin actually grows back after they do that so they can survive uh, that process, that animal behavior. So another really cool animal. Uh, anybody have any other questions about the Komodo dragons or the rib newt? Uh, do we have uh, currently plants and milk them for their venom? I don't know about the Komodo dragons. I don't think that is something that we do with the Komodo dragons, um, but I do know that we work with some of our other venomous snakes uh, to create anti-venoms. All right. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nicole, who's going to keep us going and talking about animal behaviors in the wild and uh, in captivity. And have, have you ever seen them do the rib thing? Not here. Luckily, they don't have to worry about predators here. So I have not seen them, but you can look up uh, on the internet and see some pictures. It's kind of interesting. 
All right, Nicole. All right, so welcome back. Um, so we were talking about um, uh, different behaviors that uh, help our zookeepers. Um, and Beth was talking about animal behaviors um, that was like food enrichment. So um, helping the animals get those behaviors that they would normally do in the wild um, here at the zoo. And I have a great example with one of our uh, handling animals. And here she is. See if she gets right up to the camera there. This is Parkour, uh, and she is a chinchilla. And chinchillas um, regularly jump and hop around in the wild. So they live up in the mountains. Um, they live in the Andes Mountains, and they spend a lot of time jumping and hopping through rocks, and they're actually pretty fast. Now, here at the zoo, she lives uh, in an enclosure um, that's not, it's big enough for her, but it's not like as big as the wild would be. So we have to make sure that she gets enough exercise. And so a lot of our programming with her revolves around her getting exercise and socialization. And so what we'll give her is a wheel. You've probably seen those wheels for hamsters. She gets a little bit bigger one uh, for running and making sure she doesn't get overweight uh, because at one point she was a little bit chubby. And so she had a little too much weight on her and we wanted to make sure that she was staying healthy. And so we gave her a wheel, but she also gets a ball to hop around in. So similar to a hamster ball again, uh, just a little bit bigger. And those make sure that she gets the behaviors um, that uh, she would have in the wild, like running and jumping instead of just sleeping and eating all day, which is uh, important, but not what we want to see her doing all day and all night. And so we want to make sure she has stuff to do. So does anyone have any questions about parkour, our chinchilla? She is a critically endangered animal. Uh, in the wild. So while you may have seen them uh, in uh, pet stores and things like that, uh, in the wild they're critically endangered. So there's not that many of them left and that's because a lot of people uh, took them out of the wild for their fur to make fur coats years and years ago. Uh, what does parkour eat? She loves to eat um, hay but her most favorite treats are peanuts Craisins and raisins, those are her most favorite. Uh, she does not have a friend. She actually does not get along with other chinchillas. So there are some that will live in groups. Uh, she happens to be a chinchilla that will just fight other chinchillas. And so uh, she prefers to hang out with us humans, but she's still pretty picky about which humans she likes. So I'm happy she picked me. Uh, we just have uh, one right now. So we used to have a boy named Timothy and he lived a very long time. So their lifespan in the wild is about three years, but he lived to be about 20 years old. Um, and so another thing that uh, behavior here at the zoo with uh, good health um, and enrichment and vet care, uh, animals can live a lot longer than they would in the wild. Uh, Lillian, you asked if they're coming back in the wild. Uh, they really aren't. They have a stable population, but it's very, very small and they live in a small area. So um, not that I know of that they're coming back. Good question. All right. Well, it looks like Alex is at another exhibit, so I will let her take back over. All right, everybody. So we're at another pretty unique animal uh, here in our museum. This is called a lake sturgeon, a lake sturgeon. And we are actually looking at some juvenile lake sturgeon because uh, the adult lake sturgeon can actually get upwards of six feet long. Um, so these are still in the first couple of years of their life. They range anywhere between uh, probably one to three years old in this tank. Um, and they're an extremely long lived species. They can actually live uh, to be a hundred depending on uh, the individual, which is pretty neat. And the reason I'm bringing these ones up 
is this is another animal that we do a conservation program with, which means that we are trying to increase their numbers uh, in the wild. This is an animal that is native to our area here in Toledo. Uh, they can be found in the Maumee River, uh, at least historically. Um, but within the past hundred years, they've really been pushed out of the Maumee River uh, due to overfishing, uh, harvesting of their eggs for food. And actually they were used uh, as an oil source. They have an oil uh, that's part of their body uh, that was harvested as well. And so uh, luckily the zoo has stepped in to help this animal uh, by doing a uh, basically a release program. Uh, so it's pretty cool. We actually work with some partners with uh, the Ohio Natural Resources and also with uh, some partners in Wisconsin who send us eggs. And we actually raise those eggs to hatch uh, here at our zoo in a unique facility that uh, has water from the Maumee River. So we actually have a little trailer that pumps water up from the Maumee River so that they can be spawned or hatched in water that they would uh, eventually grow up in. So that's another kind of interesting part of animal behavior is that interaction with the environment. Uh, so these guys will um, migrate. So they are a migratory species. Uh, they will migrate from the Maumee River up to Lake Erie. And part of their return to the river is the by the scent. So it was really important to us that we raised these animals in the, the water that they grew up in so that they would recognize the scent when they came back down. Uh, so once they reach maturity, uh, which can be uh, like 10 years old or more, uh, they go up into Lake Erie to get their food source. Um, so they generally have more space up in Lake Erie and more access to food but they're going to come down to spawn or have babies in the river. So um, they will make that movement back and forth. Um, and yeah, there are different color variations. They're not albino. So an albino would be uh, like pure white all over. They just have some different uh, lighter and darker color variations to them. Uh, the biggest one that we have uh, is actually in our aquarium. So we actually have some over in the aquarium that are getting close to, I would say probably three or four feet long. Uh, over there. These ones are still a little bit younger. Um, so another cool thing is that we can use animal behavior uh, to learn more about our successes in our conservation programs. Um, so not only do we monitor their behavior in captivity, like we've been talking about with a couple of our other animals with training uh, and making sure they have good welfare, uh, but even our field conservation programs can make use of behavior uh, by tracking the movements of animals. So this is a really cool thing that we did. Uh, we actually release uh, upwards of 100 of these every year in October into the Maumee River. And uh, when we do that, we put trackers in them. So uh, we actually have a couple of different types of trackers. Some of them are just simply little, little pit tags, uh, the same that you might put in your cat or dog, like a microchip. And that way, when the fishermen catch a sturgeon, they can scan it and know that it was released by the Toledo Zoo. Uh, and uh, hopefully release it back into the water and then we know that that sturgeon is still alive. Uh, but we also were able to put in some uh, more sophisticated trackers that actually will beep when they get close to a sensor. So we call those acoustic tags. And basically every time the sturgeon swims past a little beacon, uh, it will send out a signal. So again, we know exactly where they're moving and how they are interacting with their environment. So that helps us to kind of create maps of the different areas uh, that they might go. Uh, we do the same thing with some of our turtle species uh, here in Ohio as well. So some of our conservation staff will uh, put trackers on turtles to see what uh, habitats they're interacting with so we can better protect them. Uh, how big are they when they're ready to be released? We actually release them when they're pretty young. Uh, so we release them within the first year of their life. Um, so they're actually pretty, pretty small when we release them. They're just a couple of inches long. Uh, and then they continue to grow in the river. So it's really kind of almost an experiment for us to see uh, the survivorship of those individuals. This is a program that hasn't really been done before. Um, so to answer both of those questions, their whiskers and their food source, they are bottom feeders. So they're gonna use those whiskers to trail along the bottom of the river or lake uh, to find things like snails, uh, worms, little crustaceans that uh, are down on the bottom. So here at the zoo, they mostly actually get uh, night crawlers, so worms that get dumped into the water. Um, and yeah, all of our animal exhibits are temperature controlled to fit the temperature that they would normally be in. So this water is actually pretty cold um, because uh, the water in the Maumee River would be pretty cold. Now I think we keep it at a pretty regular 
cool temperature year round. I don't think we uh, we don't change it based on the seasons. Uh, they don't seem to mind. I think they probably prefer to be in the, the slightly warmer water than what's out there right now in the, the cold winter. Uh, yeah, any other questions about us? Uh, All right, well, I'm going to attempt to try and find you guys some more animals to look at. It might take me a few minutes to, to travel between exhibits, uh, but I know Nicole has a couple of cool things to, to show you in the meantime. All right, yeah, so I do have another animal to show you here, and we're going to take a look at it, and I'm going to try to test you by looking at its behavior. Let's see. Okay. So this is a snake called a Virgin Island boas. Uh, so it's a type of boa that lives in the Virgin Islands. It's obviously not very big. Um, but I want to see if you guys can guess, you can guess in the chat where it would live. So if you think it lives on the ground, up in the trees, or in the water, uh, just take a look at what it's doing and see if you can guess. Ah, uh, you guys are really good. Yes. So lots of you guess trees and you are exactly right. So uh, this is a snake that lives up in the trees and you can see it's doing this behavior um by using its strength to hang off of me so this is what it would be doing up in the trees uh, it not only helps it to climb but it helps it to eat so it would be holding on to a branch similar how it's holding on to my arm and then putting its body out to try to catch something so it's doing that right now it's not trying to eat something uh, but it's showing you how strong its body is um, and so this is a tree dwelling snake. Uh, now, this is a snake that is an endangered snake as well. And our zoo is also working to help this snake. Um, and so we have uh, different zookeepers that go to the Virgin Islands um, and help track the habitat that these snakes live in. Um, and they will uh, make sure that habitat is protected for them. But we also um, were helping to breed them here at the zoo. So we've taken a little bit of a break from that, but um, we have helped to breed them um, and we can release those snakes out into the wild if we need to as well. Uh, what do they eat? So up in the trees, they would find things to eat like eggs or small birds. Um, large bugs even they would eat, um, and then any rodent as well. And so all of those are good food sources. Now we usually say they can't eat anything that's um, bigger than the biggest part of their body. They are pretty small snakes, so they're not gonna be eating anything huge. And they are a non-venomous snake. If they were a venomous snake, I would not be holding them because it's a little too risky. And so they use the power of squeezing. So they are a constrictor um, and that will help them to eat. Any other? Oh, this snake's name is Brava. So Brava, the snake. You can see how strong that body is, which I think is pretty neat. All right, I'm gonna put Brava back, but feel free to ask any questions. Um, and it looks like Alex is out at an exhibit. All right, guys. Yeah, I wanna make sure you get to see this animal cause she is up and moving around a little bit. Um, unfortunately, I can't get too much closer to her, but hopefully if you guys are on your own computer screens, you're able to see her pretty well. Uh, so this is Talia. This is uh, one of our Amir tigers here at the Toledo Zoo. So this is a really great animal uh, to talk about all the things that we've been discussing uh, about animal behavior um, so far today. So our tigers, uh, we actually have two tigers here at the zoo. We have a male and a female. This is Talia, but we also have Titan who is in the exhibit next door. Uh, when I walked by, he wasn't outside. So I walked past his exhibit. Uh, now in the wild, 
tigers are a solitary creature, so they wouldn't really be hanging out in groups. So this would be pretty normal for them uh, to be uh, off by themselves uh, until it is time for breeding. Um, and But they do enjoy things like swimming. So we actually have a pool in here when it's a little bit warmer that they can go into. Uh, tigers are one of the few types of cats that uh, do get into the water and enjoy swimming, unlike uh, my cat at home. But of course they have a lot of really good traits to be predators, right? So they have that sense of smell, those sharp teeth, those sharp claws, and all of those hunting instincts that they uh, would normally use in the wild. And so we've talked a little bit with Beth about how we can simulate those senses here at the zoo, and that's mainly through enrichment. Um, so you can see right now in their exhibit, they actually have some enrichment set up. Uh, there's a couple of barrels right there that she can uh, tackle if she wants to. Uh, so they really enjoy uh, tackling things like barrels or big plastic pieces. Uh, there's some sticks in there. And one of uh, their favorite enrichments actually is scent enrichment. And what that means is uh, we will put things like spices or even sometimes perfumes, as long as they're safe for animals, uh, onto the things in their exhibits. And that allows them to um, sense and use their smell. They also, uh, tigers and other cats have a really cool reaction called the Fleming response. It's kind of that funny face that cats make when they smell something that's interesting where they open their mouth a little bit. Um, so tigers do that as well. Um, now I was mentioning about uh, how we have two tigers um, as part of a breeding program. So one thing we haven't talked about a lot that's important for animal behaviors and zoos, of course, is breeding. Um, so a lot of the mission of zoos uh, is to conserve animals. And part of that is creating supplementary populations in captivity uh, to kind of supplement those wild populations that might be uh, endangered, right? So uh, all zoos are at least in the US that are accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums will actually work together in order to uh, breed these animals. So we actually move animals from facility to facility in order to increase the genetics. So basically what that means is we don't want animals that are too closely related to be breeding. We want them to be different so that we can increase that um, genetic diversity. Uh, in their population. So we can send animals to other zoos. We've had, uh, in fact, some of our bears have gone to Nebraska, uh, as well as our elephants, different things like that. So uh, this was no exception. We got uh, Titan in our male as part of a special breeding program. And there's people that coordinate that to determine who gets to go where. Um, and hopefully that means that we will get to have uh, baby tigers sometime uh, in the future. Um, so those are called species survival plans. That's where we uh, plan out uh, exactly how we're going to be doing uh, the breeding. Uh, let's see, there are some questions. How long can they stay out in the snow? Uh, the Amir tiger is from uh, Siberia, so uh, basically like Russian area. So they're very used to cold weather. So I think that she actually likes to come out and play in the snow a little bit. So she could pretty much be out here all day, uh, but they do have access to the indoors uh, if they prefer to be inside. Um, and yes, I have heard uh, cases of tigers in particular being uh, susceptible to COVID, which is actually why you can see I'm keeping at least six feet from her and there's a, a glass there as well. So we try to definitely keep them uh, as, as safe as we possibly can uh, here at the zoo with all of the same uh, procedures that we would use to protect ourselves. Yeah, any other questions about the tiger? Uh, yeah, and that the natural climate and habitat, uh, they would be from uh, the taiga, T-A-I-G-A, -A, which is kind of like a evergreen forest uh, area that often does get a lot of snow, uh, but it is a forest, so they have those stripes that really help them to camouflage. Uh, this tiger, I don't believe, has had babies before. She was the offspring of uh, another tiger that we had here at the zoo, so uh, I don't think she has actually had cubs yet, so... We're crossing our fingers. Dr. Fox is going to have you. All right. Well, I'm really glad that you guys got to see her out and about. I know she was kind of pacing, so I was trying to stay uh, up with her. But I think Miss Nicole has something pretty cool to show you uh, that has to do with the tigers as well. Um, and I'll go see if I can find maybe one more animal. All right. Yeah, I do have something that uh, has something to do with the tigers. It's enrichment. Um, and so I don't know if I can get it 
in the screen. Here you go, because it's pretty big. Does anyone know what this looks like? Any guesses? Pretty torn up, but before it was torn up. Linda, you got it right. And yep, this is a giant pickle. Uh, and so we actually get this from the internet. It's a giant plastic pickle. Uh, and it is one of the tiger's favorite toys. Um, and it's a form of enrichment. So we might put a different scent on it, um, but it allows them to use their claws and their teeth to rip and tear up things, but to also play. So if any of you have had cats, um, tigers like to play in a similar way that your house cats do. So they like to bat around things and this pickle provides them a perfect enrichment opportunity. But we have to be careful because once it gets this torn up, it can cut their gums. So we have to take it away from them. Uh, but we let them play with it for a day or two until it gets too destroyed. And so not only does the um, tigers get pickles, but lots of our animals at the zoo get these giant pickles because they're thick and they provide good enrichment for the animal. Now I'm going to share a video for one of our favorite enrichments we've ever done here at the zoo and it was for our elephants. So let's see if we can get that to play here. So this was for Renee, our elephant. Um, and they built this for her to get her favorite treat, popcorn. It's her most favorite food. trunk to blow up into the tube and blow out that popcorn. Um, and when she blew out that popcorn, um, she could suck it up with her trunk. Uh, she does not eat with her trunk. Uh, she has to blow it back into her mouth. So she can't just completely suck up through her trunk. That would be like us sucking up food through our nose. Uh, but she'll blow that back into her mouth. Uh, but we constantly have to think of new ways to enrich our animals, um, especially the extremely smart ones. So elephants are uh, very, very, very intelligent. Uh, and that uh, is why we constantly come up with weird new things for them, like that one. Any questions about uh, enrichment that we've seen? Feel free to join in and ask. <laughs> there are uh, black ant things in the wall behind me, yes. This is a kid's space. Uh, it's nature's neighborhood. Um, Renee is in her mid-30s. Um, so she's middle-aged. There is not danger with popcorn for them. So like I said, they're very intelligent. Uh, so we don't need to worry about them doing something um, that would hurt themselves with that popcorn. Um, and uh, we do worry though about certain things uh, with our animals. And so we have this whole, every enrichment that we ever do at the zoo has to go through multiple people, including our veterinarian, our curator of behavior, Beth, that you just saw, um, and our uh, head zookeepers for that area. Uh, and they have to risk whether 
um, that will be good for them or if it could injure them because there's definitely stuff that could injure an animal and we have to be careful about that. So a lot of thought goes into each enrichment item. We actually do take donations for uh, enrichment. I believe that's on hold for the moment uh, because of COVID. Um, but in the past, we've taken sheets and pillowcases and t-shirts, uh, sweatshirts for our orangutans. Um, we've taken large carpet tubes and things like that. And I'm sure we will uh, start doing that again. Uh, but currently with COVID, uh, we are um, we are currently uh, stopping that for the moment. All right, any other questions? I think we are at, um, I know we are at our time. Let's see, Alex, do you have anything? No, um, oh, yeah, I wasn't able to, to get to one more animal, but I know we're getting close to our time. So I definitely wanted to thank you guys all for logging on. We can stay on for a few more minutes if there's any other questions. I know there's a couple coming through. Um, Let's see, Dawn, yes, um, so you participate in the Zoo Pail program sponsoring an animal. Some of that money does go to enrichment and the care of the animals. Yes, for sure. What are elephants predators? Um, as an adult elephant, there are not that many predators. Um, so it's basically the sick and old elephants that become susceptible to predators and the very young. Oh, how long is the transfer process once an animal is scheduled for exchange? It actually really depends upon the animal um, and the weather. So uh, most of the winter time, we don't do exchange with animals. Um, and so a lot of that happens in the warmer weather because uh, a lot of animals don't like the cold weather. And so bringing them to a new zoo is a little too stressful. What are the zoo hours now? Um, that's a great question. They change, they've been changing quite a bit. Um, right now we are open uh, Monday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, and those that's just outdoor um, and no buildings are open those days. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, most of our buildings are open as well. But we remain closed on Tuesdays uh, for deep clean. What year did the zoo start? I want to say it was around 1900. And our first animal was a groundhog. Yeah, so if uh, you asked, uh, are you doing any research on animal behavior? Uh, we constantly do research on animal behavior, and that is a lot of Beth, who talked in the very beginning. That's a lot of her job. So every day she is doing um, some work on recording animal behavior, and then they share it across zoos. Um, so she's constantly doing research on that kind of stuff. Lions can eat elephants, but not an adult healthy elephant. They would probably stay away from those because elephants can kick pretty hard. All right. All right, William or uh, Kurt, was there anything else that you uh, needed from us? I think um, I think we're good. I, I'm really pleased to see the number of questions that have come in, and uh, I have. Uh, my notes here indicate that we have uh, over 114 or 15 people that have participated in today's program. So you've really reached a lot of folks and appreciate the time you've taken to do that. Um, uh, again, I, uh, I want to thank both Alex and Nicole uh, for the excellent presentations. No doubt uh, you certainly have given us some great insight on animal behavior and maybe some insight on understanding human behavior as well. But certainly what a tremendous asset you and the zoo and the aquarium are for our city and for our citizens. Now, sort of as your masks imply, 
we need to get that vaccine so we can all enjoy the zoo uh, safely and keep the animals safe as well. So uh, again, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Yes, thank you so much. We appreciated it. All right. Well, as I mentioned at the top of today's program, we have exciting information to share for March and April. And in March, we've been invited to participate in two programs sponsored by the Toledo Opera. And here to provide details is Alyssa Greenberg, the Community Engagement Director for the Association. So Alyssa, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, just fine. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me, Kurt and Billy. And it was really fun to see the zoo presentation as well. I took some screenshots of us with the Komodo dragon. So oh, today I am <laughs> so today I am representing Toledo Opera. I am the community engagement director there. And as you can imagine, COVID-19 has stalled our main stage productions for the time being. So what we've done is we've made a pivot to virtual as well as grassroots outdoor programming, including two performances at the Toledo Zoo. But what we have coming up in March are two really wonderful virtual performances and I wanted to share a little bit about that. Is it okay if I share my screen? Sure. Okay, you just gotta change the settings. Perfect, thanks. So, what we have is an event called The Music Behind the Mural. And so the concept of that is it's an original production that's going to tell the story of the characters in the Valentine the Mural, the sorry, the Valentine Theater Mural coming to life. And so these will be original performances by our resident artists, as well as Dr. Alta and Dr. Drake Dantzler, who are two opera performers. And so that's gonna be on Thursday, March 18th at 7 p.m. free, live via Facebook Live and YouTube. And in addition to that, we have a panel presentation which is gonna be a precursor to that performance. And that is called Where's Al? Race and Representation in Music from Vaudeville to Today. So the idea behind that is that one of the characters on the Valentine mural is someone named Al Jolson who was best known for his blackface performances. And as you can imagine, that's not something that we're comfortable with putting on our production in 2021, but it's still an important topic to discuss. And so we've convened an excellent panel of artists, scholars, as well as Toledo community members to speak about um, you know, racialized costuming in vaudeville and opera from the historical to the present. And it's gonna be a really great panel. The panelists have amazing chemistry together. So it's really gonna be something to behold. And so that is also going to be online, Facebook and YouTube, and you can register at ToledoOpera.org. Excellent. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I've uh, excited to see that and really excited that uh, you've uh, offered the members of uh, UTRA the opportunity to learn about this and to participate in this program. So I see that actually you have one of UT's uh, the administrators on there, Dr. Willie McKether is, is going to be part of the, I guess he's going to be the moderator for the panel program, which is just what a week from uh, a week from, a week uh, from tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, again, uh, I, I went myself on the ToledoOpera.org uh, site, um, all one word, ToledoOpera.org, and uh, you can register there for the programs right from the, uh, right from that homepage. So uh, appreciate uh, your being here and you're sharing that information for us. So, and the, uh, the live program is going to be Thursday, March 18th at seven o'clock. So, very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate again, your being here and taking the time to, to share that information with us and offer it to us as members of UTRA and the Alumni Association. Of course, thanks for having us. Sure. Well, while you as uh, participants today have your calendars out, please mark it also for Tuesday, April 6th. That'll be our program featuring Jim Sauter to discuss the effects of COVID-19 on the wine industry. And as always, Jim will have a few wines to highlight that we have missed our attention. Now that program is going to be at four o'clock in the afternoon on April 6th. That of course is just in time for cocktail hour. So enjoy that and please watch your emails for uh, information on how to register for that program. So in addition to, uh, to Alex and, and Alyssa, I wish to thank Billy Pierce, the Associate Vice President for Alumni Affairs, who's behind the scenes here running the program. And as always to Pat Russell and Shirley Joseph, our program committee chairs, who so graciously share their time 
and their ideas to plan future programming. As always, if you have ideas for things that you'd like to see or take part in, please let us know. I look forward to seeing you next time. Be safe.